Supply chain network design, one of the favorite topics that I like to talk about on this channel. And this week, we are talking to an expert on that topic coming right up. So Prashant, it's great to talk to you again. Prashant Yadav, uh, a real expert on the topic of supply chain networks and particularly healthcare networks. Now, Prashant, forgive me, I'm going to put your CV, if you like, down below the video. But I think for the viewers, let me just say that you're a professor at INSEAD. You're a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. Uh, you lecture at Harvard Medical, Medical School. You are a global expert on healthcare supply chains, particularly. So thank you so much for uh, spending a little bit of time with us today on this topic of network designs. Now, let me just pose this very important question to you. Uh, so as well as the basics of modeling product flows, that's kind of what I'm used to in network design. What, what do you think are some of the key considerations in supply chain network design from your perspective? Yeah, Rob, thanks. So first of all, thanks for having me in your show. Uh, great pleasure to be here. I want to start by saying that healthcare supply networks are unusual in some ways and are not dissimilar to other supply chains in other ways. And network design or the way networks have evolved for health products over time is probably one area where we see some nuances, some differences from other supply chains. The key areas of differences are the manufacturing of medical products is driven by a very strong talent and competency cluster effect, right? Where there are parts of the world where there is specialization and competency in electromechanical assemblies for medical devices. There are parts of the world where there is specialization in small molecule chemistry. And these specializations have evolved um, over many decades. And initially, perhaps the choice of location in some of the clusters may have been driven by either lower labor costs or some other factor in, in some instances for medicine and manufacturing of key chemicals that go in the, in the medicine. The choices were driven by environmental considerations. The global standards are not truly harmonized on effluent treatment and on what can be discharged as, um, as uh, discharges from manufacturing of chemicals and, and in particular active pharmaceutical ingredients. So, Many companies chose to locate in places where the environmental standards were somewhat lax. Oh. Competencies developed in those clusters. A third so, fact. So, can I just interrupt you there for a second? Because when you're talking there about these this sort of uh, centers of competency, I'm thinking, do we see that in any other industries? Is it is it just in healthcare and medical devices? So we see that across industries, right? We see that in uh, we see that in semiconductor manufacturing, another yeah, chain which has been a lot in the news and under public scrutiny. Yeah. But um, that there it is not a combination of these factors of competency of staff, capital expenditure, uh, environmental standards. In the case of medical devices and medical products, it's this unique combination of four or five factors coming together. And um, in addition to what I described earlier, there is also proximity to some stocking materials. So uh, nitrile gloves, which are a part of the personal protective equipment that was uh, a lot on, in the news and the public scrutiny during COVID-19. Um, nitrile gloves are, the manufacturing is located closer to places where we see latex and, and rubber, which means in Southeast Asia. There are also some unique substances in health products. One example is the adjuvants that go into certain vaccines, not all, but some adjuvanted vaccines. Um, they occur only in naturally occurring substances, such as a soap bar tree that is knit only in Chile, or squalene-based adjuvants that come from shark liver oil, so only in regions where you can obtain that. So the, the economic geography of the healthcare supply network is driven by a large number of factors, some which are dynamic and some which are less dynamic and have become 
almost static in a longer term. These are also influenced by government policy. And um, many, many factors driven by government incentives, not just the tax incentives that we hear often about, but many other kinds of uh, purchasing, direct subsidy incentives, uh, which also determine that. So co co complex combination of factors are going into determining the shape and form of the supply network for health products. That's, that's fascinating. I've, I've never really thought of, uh, you know, the, the medical supply industry being that constrained, if you like, or that concentrated. So the obvious question in the back of my mind now is, so that must create some fairly significant issues in managing health supply chains. So what does this do? Does it, does it restrain capacity? Does it impact cost? Three in the direct manifestations of this economic geography. One is, of course, there is geographical concentration of manufacturing of certain products in certain geographies. So we don't see a very well geographically diversified manufacturing network. The second is, in some cases, the nature of the supply network and the interdependencies across different nodes are such that the ability to respond to sudden surges in demand is slower in the healthcare supply network relative to other industries. A third is because it is a heavily regulated industry, when you want to add new capacity, you plan. It's not as simple as making the capital expenditure and, and setting up the site. There are a large number of regulatory steps uh, that a manufacturing site has to go through, and that adds to the lead times for setting up a new new manufacturing site and having it start producing commercial at commercial scale. So those are three things which make it very peculiar and um, not necessarily have the kind of ability to match sudden demand surges that we would want to see in a supply chain for products for. Uh, life-saving commodities. Yeah, and I, and I suppose the classic example is during COVID-19 when, you know, people are maybe thinking, why can't more countries manufacture vaccines? I mean, there are, I'm here in Australia, people are asking that, why can't we suddenly make Pfizer vaccines here? Uh, and from what you've described, I mean, it, it's extremely complex supply chain and the regulatory environment and so on as well. It's, it's not as easy as so many other industries, is it? So just throw up new factories and turn on manufacturing? I think in, in particular, skilled staff and access to key input materials. Mm. Um, when I say key input materials, in particular for COVID vaccines, we've come to realize that uh, a lot of manufacturing now occurs using single-use bioreactors or single-use equipment more generally. So instead yeah. of the large static stainless steel or glass bioreactors, we increasingly use um, large plastic bags. You make one bag and then you essentially dispose off that bag and then you get a new one and make a new batch and so on. So in order to set up new manufacturing sites, not only do you need the know-how and the competency in the staff, but you also need access to such materials such as single use and that supply chain has come under a very significant strain because companies which manufacture such sophisticated single-use equipment batteries, they usually work with order books that run uh, many years into the future because if someone is setting a manufacturing site, they typically have a lead time of two, three years. They place their order, companies put it in their order book, deliver it in months time or some period of time like that. Now we suddenly have lots of new manufacturing sites coming up or existing sites being expanded. And so the strain on some of these key inputs that have to go in has become immense. Once again, the lead time to set up a new manufacturing site for polymeric bags or other filtration equipment uh, runs into 6, 12, 18 months. So even if those manufacturers do want to set up their new uh, or expand their manufacturing sites, it'll only be mid of next year or somewhere like that before equipment is available. And then that equipment has to be installed, commissioned, validated, 
um, and regulatory tests have to be passed. So, so the such that adding new sites in um, vaccine manufacturing typically ends up taking a couple of years at least. Yeah, that, that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, Prashant, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I know you're an extremely busy man. You're in the States at the moment and you're heading back to uh, to France to uh, to teach again at INSEAD. Uh, fascinating insights there. Uh, maybe for those watching, has this got you thinking about other supply chains which have some of these unique aspects? Can you think of supply chains maybe that, that like the medical supply chains we've been talking about are not so easy to just turn on, turn off and, and move. I've got a couple in the back of my mind I'd be very interested to uh, to see in the comments down below what you think. So Prashant, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, maybe we'll have to get you back to uh, talk about another topic very soon. Thank you.